the United States a hundred years ago. A new nation of vast distances where opportunity awaited those who had the courage and initiative to seize it. In the 1840s and 50s, this young America was extending its boundaries across the continent. New lands were acquired, new territories were opened, new frontiers were established. No question of America's bigness in those early years. But that very bigness had in it the weakness that threatened the economic hopes of our young nation. What good were these new hopes that beckoned across almost endless stretches of land when our people could reach them only by travel on horseback or covered wagon trains across vast prairies? The rigors of stagecoach travel on washed out trails or the slow, tedious journeys down rivers and canals. As in every period of crisis in the economic growth of America, Men of enterprise and foresight arose to meet the challenge. They built the railroads, a new form of transportation that saw shining rails supplant the torturous trails of the wagon train, and engines of steam carry people and goods on a silver highway that was destined to lead America to industrial greatness. The railroad reached into every corner of the land, it provided a growing America with a spark to light the torch of progress. It was the dynamic force needed to transform a vigorous, sprawling country into a rich and powerful nation. New inventions spurred the continuing advance of our industrial needs. And in the vanguard of these achievements was the automobile. The early horseless carriage gave little indication of the tremendous popularity it was to enjoy, or the vital effect it was to have on the American way of existence. The roads and streets that had served the horse and carriage soon became inadequate to meet the demands of automobile travel. The passing years brought successive road building programs initiated on local, state, and national levels. As roads were built, the number of motor vehicles using these roads increased at an accelerated pace. Today, we are still faced with the need for safer, better highways to support our motorized economy. One segment of that economy, the rising industry of motor freight carriers, has a particular interest in adequate highways because it depends on them for the speed and efficiency of its operations. The number of these highway freight carriers and the number of vehicles they operate also have steadily increased, brought about largely through the building of new plants in outlying sections of industrial areas where direct rail service is not readily available. Of course, the motorist feels that he too has more than a passing interest in the cost and upkeep of our highway system. Yet really adequate highways and access routes are a long way from reality. Here is an extreme example. The road is blocked. Traffic is at a standstill. Here is another road, a railroad. One of its characteristics is excess capacity, the ability to take on more of the transportation load. Both railroad men and representatives of common carrier trucking companies believe our transportation system will benefit by putting trucks on that steel highway and carrying them between cities on railway flat cars. And what flat cars? Giant new 75-footers that carry two large trailers each. Yes, piggyback is what the railroad and progressive trucking companies are offering to the traffic manager with a job of transportation on his hands. And it isn't a new, untried idea. As long back as the last century, the Long Island Railroad brought in wagon loads of potatoes on flat cars. Look closely, and you'll see that the horses rode in boxcars on the same train. This new type of service soon spread to other railroads, and in the years that followed, piggyback transport received great impetus. Some railroads offering this type of service have used and still use their own truck trailers. But the most dramatic recent growth has been in the type of piggyback transport available to common carrier truckers, as exemplified by the Pennsylvania Railroad's truck train service. 
Here, on America's largest railroad, the future of truck train may well be determined. And just what is truck train? Well, for a first-hand look at this most recent step in the progress of American transportation, let's make the trip on a fast freight truck train. Our trip starts at the shipper's plant. This particular truck is carrying merchandise from Chicago to New York. The driver picks it up as per instructions, and after sealing the door of the van, he begins the journey across Chicago to the railroad yards in the south side of the city. The terminal point in Chicago, as in most large cities, is accessible from many different routes. This advantage enables the driver to use such roads and streets as are less likely to be congested with traffic. Upon arrival at the yard, the trailer is driven onto a scale where it is weighed to make certain it conforms to the required standards. It is also checked for height. A steel band is placed across the doors. And while the driver checks the trailer in, the steel band is sealed in place. Having obtained his receipt for the shipment, the driver moves his truck out promptly to make room for the next arrival. As his last part in the operation, the driver takes his trailer to the loading yard located on railroad property. In this area, he parks it close to the ramp among other trailers waiting to be loaded. The driver leaves his trailer and returns to the trucking company. Flat cars are specially built for this service, each one large enough to hold two big trailers. Now, another driver hooks up to our trailer. He is a specialist in loading the trailer onto the flat cars and will place the trailer on the string of cars assigned to carry it to its destination. His trained eye heads it up the ramp straight for the bridging plates to the flat cars. Then down along between the limits of the flat car railings. The tires roll straight to their mark. Wheel chocks are immediately placed to prevent movement of the trailer and special supporting jacks are swung into position while retaining chains are tightened. Regular truck tractors may be used to load the trailers or they may have the newly developed twin steering wheel. This enables the driver to look straight ahead of him regardless of the direction in which he is traveling. Once more, a trailer travels with precision down the waiting line of flat cars. The hook of a retaining chain firmly grips the heavy guardrail as other wheel chocks slide snugly to the tires. With swift efficiency, the loading team is soon ready to move on to the next arrival. For at loading time, the trailers pour in in a steady stream. Before the train departs from the loading track, every trailer is examined to make sure it is securely in place. It is late Saturday afternoon in Chicago as this fast freight train pulls out eastbound for New York via Pittsburgh and Philadelphia. Out of Chicago through the night rolling across Indiana and then into Ohio and across Pennsylvania headed for Pittsburgh, Philadelphia and New York. Clear track ahead on its own all-weather roadway. Long before dawn on Monday, arrival in Jersey City of this train that left Chicago late Saturday. 900 miles in transit, early second morning arrival, and cargo ready for delivery at final destination on the East Coast. The trailers are released from their moorings and wheel chocks. Away they go to their various delivery points in New York and other cities. Let's follow ours on the last lap of its journey. Here it is at the 
receiving platform of the consignee in New York and ready for unloading. The last step in Operation Truck Train. What we have just seen is the merging of public service by the railroad and the common carrier truck. What are the benefits? Joint participation enables the trucking company to concentrate its employees on sales and service in a terminal area and permits the railroad to assume the responsibilities of the fast, long-haul operations which characterize truck train service. It thus strengthens two segments of our important common carrier system. In like manner, it enables trucking company personnel and railroad employees to share in a growing form of transportation with increasing opportunities as this type of freight shipment serves more and more terminal points, carries more and more trailers, and an increasing variety of goods. To the shipper, truck train service offers still another form of transportation competing for his business, one with obvious advantages to meet his needs for fast, high-quality service on a large scale. To all interested in the adequacy of our highway system, this form of transportation offers the possibility that, as it grows, it will contribute in some measure to lessening the burden on our road system of steadily mounting over-the-road motor traffic. For the railroads offer clear passage on their own roadway. On this roadway, day and night, in good weather and bad, truck train traffic is scheduled and routed to provide high-speed, dependable transportation service. These, then, are some of the benefits flowing from the present trend toward shipment of trailers on rail. Benefits that will become even greater as this new type of freight transport develops in range and scope. In effect, a cooperative working arrangement between the railroads and the trucking companies of America. It is in the true spirit of the opening of new frontiers that has made ours a great nation. It is true progress in transportation progress that will help all of us. The most efficient and economical means of transportation ever developed is the modern steam railroad system. And although a steam locomotive had not been conceived in the mind of man, and railroad tracks had not even been dreamed of at the time our story begins, yet we're going to show you how a great American laid the foundations for one of the world's greatest railroads, and securely fixed a young nation in its place in the world with the bonds of transportation. 25 years after George Washington had passed to the immortal, the steam locomotive made its appearance. Railroads sprang up along the old routes of travel. Small, scattered short lines were built and then hooked together. The Richmond and Allegheny Railroad took over all the rights of way and appurtenances of the James River Company, and George Washington's canal became a railroad. Other lines built along the route of the Midland Trail were extended, then combined. And finally, all found their way into the Chesapeake and Ohio lines of today. George Washington's Railroad, built on the routes he selected. And here we see George Washington's Railroad as it is today, smoothing the road, making easy the way between East and West, as Washington predicted in his letter to Governor Harrison. We'll start at the wonderful city of Cincinnati, first named the Fort Washington. This new Cincinnati Union Terminal, where we board the George Washington, is one of the most magnificent structures ever built for the convenience and comfort of travel. It is used by seven railroads and costs $40 million. When you play bridge or poker, you ought to think of Cincinnati, because more playing cards are made here than in any other city in the world. When you wash your hands or face, take a bath, you ought to think of Cincinnati because the first bathtub in the United States was here, and it leads the world in making soap. It had the first steam fire engine, the first machine gun, and the first professional baseball club. Cincinnati has half again more telephones than any other city of its size. And here's 
the George Washington, leader of the finest fleet of air-conditioned trains in the world. Glance at one of the great, almost human machines which wheels you swiftly and safely through the night while you sleep like a kitten. It's not only a locomotive, it's a traveling pop plant. Loaded with 20 tons of coal and 16,000 gallons of water, this mechanical wonder is going to convert 4,000 gallons of water into steam every 60 minutes. And into its giant furnace is going to go every hour two tons of the finest coal in the world. But the fireman doesn't have to shovel it like he used to. He just turns this little gadget and machinery does it more scientifically and more effectively than a man could do it with a shovel. But the fireman still has plenty to do and plenty of responsibility. He's the engineer's right-hand man. Here's the engineer, a fine citizen, a man who owns his own home and sends his boys and girls to college. He's able, cool-headed, resourceful, and experienced, or he wouldn't be in the cab of the George Washington. This is the man who does your driving for you when you travel by rail. Peering through the fog and storm when the airplanes are grounded and the trucks and motor cars are stalled in snow drifts, he's the man who drives every day in the year, no matter what the anything. He has to fight the road hogs at the crossings and dodge the nitwits who want to race the train. He spent many long, hard years as a fireman before the company ever trusted him with a locomotive. He brings you safely and comfortably to your destination. All is part of the day's work. There is only one place where you are safer than when riding with him, and that's in your own bed at home. While you're easy and comfortable back in your car, don't forget the engineer. Food is an important part of traveling, and here it is, going aboard the tavern car. It's the best food obtainable in any market and the highest prices are paid to get it. In and out of season, you get nothing but fresh food. All aboard. We're off on the George Washington, the world's most famous passenger train. We look at the cars on the train. Here's one quite different. It is designed for passengers who do not wish Pullman accommodations and exemplifies the policy of giving the very finest of transportation for just the price of the railroad ticket. It seats only 45 people, no crowding you see, and has real individual chairs for every passenger. They turn in any direction. Couples or parties of two or four or six can foregather here. It is fully carpeted, has individual reading lights, and if you're a big butter and egg man and want to work while you ride, that's easy, or you can have a table. There's a women's lounge room, too, for making a toilet or taking a smoke. We had trouble at first convincing passengers that there was no extra charge. Now, right here in the most convenient location in the train is a tavern car. It's not called the dining car because it isn't like anything you've known as a diner. You'll notice it looks more like a dining room. Spotless linen, shining silver, gleaming glassware, all like a first-class restaurant. The delicate colonial tableware was designed to delight your eye. The walls are refreshing light shades of early American colonial, which would have to be kept clean if genuine air conditioning didn't keep them that way. But it does. The meals are cooked by experienced chefs, and if what you want isn't on the menu, one of them probably knows how to cook it and will be glad to do so. Next time you're on a tavern car, ask the steward to take you through the kitchen. You'll be glad to, and you'll marvel at what cooks can do in such small space, and how spotless and ship-shaped everything is. But seeing is believing. Here's the Mount Vernon dinner. the tavern dinner. It's a he-man's meal for anybody. But the Mount Vernon dinner is the favorite. First is a choice of relishes. This man likes a fruit cocktail. Then there's a choice of soup. This fellow likes consomme. Then there's always fish, fowl, and meat. 
This two-fisted chap likes a steak. And look at it. A steak is as a steak. And with it, any kind of potatoes, choice of other vegetables, a salad, a choice among six desserts, and whatever you like to drink. Chesapeake in Ohio doesn't make any money on this dinner. It couldn't possibly do that, for there isn't enough volume of business on any train to make a dining car profitable. But we're not selling food, we're selling transportation. Oh, incidentally, we don't prohibit passengers from doing anything in our tavern cars that they like to do in their own home. The steward will invite you to have a cigarette. Here's a lounge car mid-train for the convenience of folks who don't want to walk way through to the observation end. And we call this the library, because it's quiet here for those who want to read or work. After a good meal, the observation lounge is a comfortable place to settle down. Newspapers, magazines, stock market reports, and sporting bulletins to read. And then, of course, there's the radio, with the music of your favorite orchestra. There's no reason why you should be cut off from the world when you travel. Radio keeps you in touch with the news of the day. But if you want to rest and relax, forget the busy world and look at the marvelous country and the interesting places as you speed along. Augusta, Kentucky was settled by revolutionary soldiers in 1785, the same year George Washington's railroad was founded. It's the only town in the world built on the bones of unknown people. Here, the first Methodist college west of the Alleghenies was located. We are entering Iceland to rejoin the train from Cincinnati. The setting sun is dipped below the rim of the haze and shrouded hill which frame the course of the beautiful Ohio. It's almost bedtime. The travelers who are going to sleep like kittens and arrive fresh as daisies are making ready to enjoy a night of genuine air conditioning. There's no mystery about this modern magic which banishes excess humidity, noise and dirt. It's almost too simple to be true. Sleeping cars on the George Washington have accommodations to suit anybody's taste. Single berths and single sections, of course, for those who prefer them, with real coil spring mattresses, regular miniature box springs, just like you have at home. Maybe for the family, you want a room or a suite of rooms with individual accessories. The George Washington has those, too. Then, if you want privacy, here's a single bedroom. By day, it's a luxurious apartment with a deep cushioned divan. At night, it's a private bedroom with private accessories and a bed six inches longer than a bird. Think of that, you long fellows who have been trying to be contortionists when you put on your pants in an upper. No use taking time to look at the other cars. They're all like this. Brilliantly lighted, cheerfully decorated, spotlessly clean, and of course, genuinely air conditioned. Each one is a traveling home with its own water system and power plant and supplied with its linen, bed clothes, and other equipment for your comfort. It represents an investment of $40,000 or the equivalent of this splendid home. Sleep like a kitten and arrive fresh as a daisy are more than slogans. And now there are lots of other things going on all over this great railroad. You rarely see them and probably know little of them. So we're going to give you several quick glances. But the wonderful new river gorge combines them all. Deeper than the gorge of the Niagara, it is a riot of scenic grandeur through which we pass on our way to begin our ascent of the western slope of the Allegheny Mountains. One section of our train is going on to Washington, Baltimore, Philadelphia, and New York. But for the moment, we will remain with the other section, which is going on to Richmond, Newport News, Old Point Comfort, and Norfolk. But before we go, we will look around this gateway to history land, the land where more American history has been made than in any other... Newport 
Pittsburgh Mews, where Chesapeake and Ohio rails come down to tidewater, is the largest terminal occupied by one railroad. George Washington's railroad enters the national capital at its front door, crossing the broad expanse of the historic Potomac. The visitor's first view as he leaves the great Union terminal is the dome of the capital on the site selected by Washington, its cornerstone laid by him. This is Illinois, mighty heart of a mighty nation. One of the great industrial workshops of America. One of the great trading centers of the world. A state blessed with a wealth of natural resources. And with good earth in which to grow bountiful crops. This is Illinois today. This was Illinois a hundred years ago, a barren prairie wilderness, virtually cut off from the rest of the railroads of Illinois, progress has one meaning, to serve people better at lower cost per ton mile. Progress is the keynote of the research center of the Association of American Railroads, located in Chicago on the campus of the Illinois Institute of Technology. This is the nationwide center of a continuing program of research and development which, since World War II, has brought about a technological revolution in railroading, second to none in American industry. Most familiar sign of this revolution is the diesel locomotive, with its increased speed, its power to pull longer and heavier trains, to save time in starts and stops, and to operate continuously with virtually no time lost for repairs and service. In 1946, only 10% of rail traffic was being moved by diesels. Today, diesels haul 98% of all rail passengers and freight. Diesel power has made it possible to lengthen freight trains an average of better than 20% and to increase the gross ton miles hauled per train hour by nearly 40 percent. This increased operating efficiency has produced a large part of the money with which railroads have been able to make other improvements. For example, since World War II, 700,000 freight cars have been placed in service, including piggyback cars that relieve congestion on public highways by moving the huge trucks on intercity halls. Passenger trains are continuously being modernized to provide greater comfort and speed and superior service. 
Many new types of mechanical equipment have been developed to ensure faster, safer handling of goods in shipment. Equally great advances have been made in methods of maintaining and improving roadbeds to give bigger and faster trains a smoother ride than ever before. Nerve center of rail operation is traffic control. Each train's position is indicated by a pilot light on the board and simple finger movements control hundreds of switches so trains can proceed on schedule with speed and complete safety. Since World War II, nearly 25,000 miles have been added to the lines controlled from centralized traffic control centers. The modern wonders of electronics have gone to work for the railroads. Microwave radio, radar, and television all have their place in the intricate system of communications by which the railroads conduct their far-flung operations. A classification yard is a miracle of automation. This is where freight cars are received, sorted, and made up into new trains. Here, by simply pushing a button, the operator routes cars, one after another, to the correct classification tracks. If a car should be rolling too fast, it's automatically slowed down by retarders that grip its wheels. This is progress. New means of serving people better at lower cost per ton mile. Since World War II, the railroads have spent an average of a billion dollars a year, every year, on modernization. Railroads mean many things to the people of Illinois, and to thousands of our people today, they mean jobs. Just to keep this one freight yard going, gives work to 125 men, and that's just a drop in the bucket. The jobs of a good many railroaders are well known, because these are the men you see when you ride a train. But for every trainman, there are four or five men and women working behind the scenes. Doing what? Almost everything. There are welders and radar technicians, pastry chefs and punch card operators, machinists and research chemists, drivers and accountants, lawyers, linemen, sweepers, and elevator operators. You name the job, and it's on the railroad's payroll, a payroll that amounts to $575 million a year right here in Illinois. In the Prairie State alone, the railroads employ more than 110,000 people, more than in any other state in the Union. And that's just direct employment. Take this group of people. While they are not railroaders, they are among the 200,000 men and women working in Illinois industries and businesses that sell principally or exclusively to railroads. Counting families, well over a million Illinois residents depend on the railroads for their livelihood. That's how big a stake we have in our railroads. Throughout Illinois, steel rails spell employment, and they spell a great deal more. How much would a farming community prosper with only a local market to serve? It's the railroads that give them direct access to nationwide markets and worldwide markets. And the railroads not only transport the produce, but get right in there and help our farmers to operate more efficiently and profitably. And just as the railroads caused many a town in Illinois to come into being, so they're still a main force in keeping our towns and cities alive and helping them grow. The health of an industrial community is tied directly to the health of the railroads that serve it, bringing in the raw materials and delivering its products. The railroads know, too, 
that what is good business for the community is good business for them. So they work hand in glove with communities throughout the state, helping them to build up the industries they have and to attract new industries. Then take the matter of taxes, local taxes. Did you know that the Union Station in Chicago, just one of that city's six major rail terminals, has an annual tax bill of $913,000? A much smaller railroad station pays about $4,000 in taxes, while the municipal airport in a similar sized city pays no taxes at all. In fact, it's actually a tax burden because it takes property off the tax rolls. But that's another story. In this town, for example, the railroad pays nearly $10,000 in taxes to help support the local government and provide municipal services. And in the same town, the railroad contributes $7,000 in taxes to help educate the children. In many school districts, the railroads pay more than 50% of the total school budget. Throughout Illinois, railroads contribute almost 20 million a year to support our schools and 22 million to the running of our towns, cities, and villages. That's a total of 42 million. So it's clear to see that anything that hurt the railroads would hurt every one of us right in the pocketbook. As employers, as taxpayers, as builders of our economy, the railroads are mighty valuable neighbors to have in a community. Without these vital arteries of commerce, we could never have built up to the high standard of living we enjoy today. Equally important to all of us is the part the railroads play in our national defense, especially in these times of continuing international tension. The lesson of World War II is clear. By 1941, some people were inclined to think of railroads as old-fashioned, outmoded. Public fancy had been caught up by newer modes of transportation. The war, some thought, would be fought and won in the air. Yet. During World War II, the railroads transported more than 90% of all military freight traffic and 97% of all organized military passenger movements. As for the place of railroads in the future, in an age of rockets and missiles, that place has been defined by General James A. Van Fleet, who commanded our 8th Army in Korea. General Van Fleet has written, Military planners know that they must look to railroads for the great bulk of the military requirement for transport. In the future, as in the past, the railroads of the United States are as much a part of the military strength of the nation as our Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marines, because none of these great armed services could long operate without the logistical support which the railroads provide. No other form of transport nor all other forms combined could take over the job of the railroads. We must therefore take care to see that they are kept strong, vigorous, and progressive. Proud of the progress they've made, the men of the railroads are yet the first to say that they should be doing more. So why aren't they? Why aren't we doing more? Because we haven't been permitted to share in the post-war prosperity that has come to this nation. On our drawing boards, we have all kinds of improvements that have tremendous payoff potentials in terms of better service at lower cost. But these projects take money. And where is the money coming from in an industry whose rate of return on net investment has not been a reasonable 6%, nor even 5%, nor even 3%? but a meager two and three quarters percent. Such meager earnings not only leave little money for improvements, but make it next to impossible for us to attract investment capital with which to build. The situation is not due, as you have seen, to the railroad's lack of interest in efficiency or its failure to keep up with the times. It's due to the fact that in today's highly competitive transportation market, 
the railroads are forced to fight with their hands tied behind their backs. Let's look at it this way. Suppose you owned a business of your own. You bought the land and built the store with your own money. You pay taxes on that land and store, of course. You work hard to help your town grow. You pay to keep up your property. You sweep your sidewalks and shovel your own snow. Now, suppose another man decides to open a competitive store. And your town fathers make him a present of a part of the courthouse square. He doesn't pay for it and he doesn't pay taxes on it. He lets the town sweep his sidewalk and shovel his snow. And mind you, it's your taxes that are helping to pay for this. You wouldn't call it fair, would you? And that's not all. When you were the only business of its kind in town, suppose the town had passed a lot of regulations governing your business and your prices. Now you've got competition, but you're still regulated. While this competitor, because he's subsidized, is able to take your business and your customers away. People in your town may think they're able to buy more cheaply, but what kind of a bargain are they really getting when you figure the hidden costs? That's the situation the railroads face. We're being treated by government, national, state, and local, as though we still had a monopoly on transportation. Whereas, in fact, of course, we have very unfair competition. And to make matters worse, while the railroads are being hogtied, our competitors are being pampered. We hear a lot of talk about wonderful new highways. We have a $41 billion highway program to be carried out over the next 10 years. $41 billion. That's more than the total investment in railroads in the last 125 years. This will bring the total since 1921 to roughly 140 billion of public funds spent to create a mass transportation plant which operates in direct competition to the railroads. Highways are supposed to be paid for by the users, but user taxes have amounted to less than half the total money spent. Even so, on a ton-mile basis, a private car pays four times what a truck pays. So a highway trucker pays nothing to build his right-of-way, pays far less than his share for maintenance and replacement, and pays virtually no taxes to support schools, welfare programs, and government. The situation is much the same with air transportation. The right-of-way is the National Airway System of Navigational and Safety Aids operated by the federal government. Airports and terminal facilities are provided by the taxpayers, and charges collected cover only a fraction of the cost. What's more, every airport built means more land taken off the tax rolls. Water carriers are in the same favored position. They pay none of the cost of dredging channels of improving and maintaining their right-of-way. They pay no charges for the use of public dock facilities and locks, whereas the federal government has poured nearly two and one-half billion dollars into this work, and state and local governments huge sums in addition. And while using all these tax-supported facilities, the barge lines themselves pay virtually nothing in taxes. By contrast, Railroads have used their own private capital for their right-of-way and track construction, for bridges and stations, and they maintain the right-of-way entirely at their own expense. And far from being subsidized, the railroads pay heavy taxes to federal, state, and local governments, taxes which directly help to subsidize their competitors. Railroads then are required to help pay for highways, airways, airfields, and waterways, but are denied equal rights given their competitors to use these facilities for a business purpose. The railroads believe that every company engaged in transportation should have the right to use every tool of the transportation trade, trains, trucks, airplanes, and vessels, in order to offer a one-package transportation service, using the most efficient service or services to do a given job. This they are now forbidden to do by regulations. For instance, one regulation deprives the railroads of equal opportunity to share in transporting agricultural commodities, which when transported by motor carrier are exempt from regulation. 
This and other regulations bar the railroads from taking steps that any prudent businessman would take in the face of competition. The prosperity of this land has been built by business units that produce a commodity or service that adds to our overall national product. On that basis, what's the picture in transportation? In a single year, the federal government expanded the labor of 28,500 people and $515,185,000 to promote transportation by air. To promote transportation by water, the federal government invests 25,694 people and $808,662,500. To promote highway transportation, 4,209 people and $2 billion $408,931,000. But to promote railway transportation, the federal government invests not one man and not one cent. This clearly shows which modes of transportation are a drain on our economy and which one is at work building our economy. The railroads pay their own way, every step of the way, and that's the way they want it to be. They're not looking for handouts or favors. All they ask is that all forms of transportation pay their own way, making adequate compensation for the use of public property and services. They ask to be allowed to use public highways and waterways and airways on the same basis as others. And they seek freedom from antiquated laws and regulations in order to compete for business in a competitive market. In other words, what we ask is simply for fair play and freedom to build for a future strong, vigorous, and progressive. The plight of the railroads has attracted nationwide attention, and a committee of the United States Senate investigating the situation concluded that a new attitude is essential if we are to stop the destruction of a vital part of the transportation system and the downward trend of our nation's economy. This is a matter of vital concern to all Americans, and especially to the people of Illinois. Rail transportation has been responsible for the transformation of Illinois within two lifespans from an untamed wilderness into a great agricultural and industrial commonwealth. It's literally true that the economy of our state rides on rails. As taxpayers, too, the railroads are leading citizens of the state, paying 20 million a year to support our schools and 22 million a year to our local governments. A total of 42 million paid by the railroads that individual taxpayers would otherwise have to pay. And in our national determination to remain strong, that we may remain free, we look to the railroads as one of the basic weapons in our arsenal. As citizens of Illinois, we depend upon the railroads for our economic well-being as we depend upon them for the defense of our freedom. We need our railroads, and we need them strong, vigorous, and progressive. Our stake in the railroads is our stake in the future of this land. It's that simple and that urgent.